Hello everyone, welcome to part 3 of this series where I try to build a CPU in Factorio using belts. In this video, I will first show you a couple of new ideas that I've been experimenting with, and then we'll get to the main event, which is the arithmetic logic unit. If you're new to this series, then I do recommend watching parts 1 and 2 first, just so that you'll understand the background, the basic concepts and various circuit components that I'm using. So previously, I've been using green circuits almost exclusively to represent signals. All the circuits I've been working with before took green circuits from the input side and also produced green circuits at the output. But there's really no reason we have to do things that way, and Factorial's belt system is in fact much more flexible than that. You could just as easily use any other type of item to represent the signal. You can even switch between multiple types of items on the same belt, and that'll work just fine, as long as filters are set correctly. For example, here's a circuit that I introduced in part 1, which produced a copy of a signal as well as the inverse of a signal. At the time, because the output was a different material, I opted to add more circuitry onto this to make much larger circuits for our inverter and signal copier. Thinking about it now though, having a different material really isn't a big deal, and there's no reason to use these two large circuits when we can get both of them in one tiny package. That immediately lets us reduce the size of other circuit components as well. This was our exclusive OR gate, and if you remember from part 1, this whole thing in the middle was a NOT gate. Using our smaller inverter, we can now reduce the circuit to this, which is almost half the size. And remember this full adder from part 1? Half of its area was taken up by signal copiers, and there are also two large exclusive OR gates. This whole thing can be reduced to just this. And here we have the master slave D flip-flop, or the memory cell that I demonstrated in part 2. Here is the version that I said I made more compact to save space last time. And here is an even more compact version that we can do now. Using multiple item types on belts doesn't have to stop there. So far everything I've done has been with binary signals, either on or off. But why not use item type to encode more information? For example, why not use 10 different types of items to represent 10 different values? That way, a single belt can transmit a full decimal digit. That's what this circuit will illustrate. First of all, let me show you the encoding scheme that I'm using. Basically, I'm using these 10 materials to represent the 10 possible digits, and the value that a belt is carrying depends on the type of item flowing through it. If this color scheme looks familiar to you, that's because it's the standard color code for resistor values. The way this circuit works is, first of all, we have one input coming in from the top left here, and this gets passed through a series of filters that will detect if the signal matches a specific value. In our case, the signal is a 3 right now, and so it can only pass through this filter. This causes the row corresponding to this value to be activated. Each row is made up of a series of signal copiers, so that a copy of the signal can be sent down to the cells below, and the original signal can still travel down the row to reach all the remaining cells. Each cell is also essentially a signal copier, but the material type being output from each one is specifically programmed to be a pattern that we want. On this row for example, the pattern encoded here is 00, 03, 06, 09, 1, 2, and so on. The output from each cell here gets sent down along these vertical belts to the bottom. At the bottom, the second input passes through a similar set of filters, and this is responsible for activating the corresponding column. Right now the signal is a 7, and so the column for this value is activated which puts the items we received from this column, namely the numbers 2 and 1, onto the final output. So have you figured out what this circuit does yet? Remember our inputs were 3 and 7, and the output is 2, 1. Let's try something else. If we change the inputs to 9 and 4, then the output is 3, 6. That's right, it's multiplication. This grid is the full 9x9 multiplication table, and all the circuit is doing is looking up values at the right row and column. In general, this technique is useful for implementing lookup tables, 
or things that involve picking out one specific entry from a list. There are disadvantages to doing things this way, though. For one thing, it's much harder to copy a signal when you have to account for 10 different possible item types. Also, a 10x10 lookup table is a lot of work to build, and you don't want to have to build all of that if there are simpler ways to calculate the answer. And now it's time to talk about our arithmetic logic unit, or ALU. The one I built here is a 6-bit 7-function ALU. In the middle here is the ALU's core logic circuit. Each column here performs one distinct operation, which I will describe in detail later. The output of the ALU goes to the bottom and gets fed into these six memory cells. The values from these memory cells then go back up to the top and becomes one set of inputs to the ALU. There is also a second set of inputs which is manually controlled for now. The item colors here are not important, they are mainly a side effect of copying signals. But for visual clarity, I did try to color code them according to the purpose that they serve. In this type of design, the group of memory cells providing one set of inputs to the ALU is called a register. And specifically, when the register is one that receives the output of the ALU, it's called the accumulator. Now let's talk about the functions. This input here controls which function the ALU will perform, and this is a multi-valued signal with seven possible item types. These things here are the same mechanism we used before for the multiplication table to select a specific column based on the selected function. In this case, each column carries the result of one operation. The first operation, selected using purple signs, is a bitwise NOT. It takes the input coming from the accumulator and passes it through signal inverters. That way, the output has the inverse of each bit. Right now, the value in the accumulator is 011001, and so the result of this operation is 100110. The second operation, selected using white signs, is a left shift. It will shift all the bits to the left by one position. This is done by simply taking a copy of the last 5 bits from the accumulator's value, notice the top bit is not used, and connecting these to the top 5 bits of the output, notice it's the bottom bit that's not connected here. Similarly, the next operation is a right shift, which shifts bits in the other direction. Again, with an accumulator value of 011001, the result of a left shift is 110010, and the result of a right shift is 001100. The next four operations will use both sets of inputs. To start, we have red and green signs for bitwise AND and bitwise OR operations respectively. These are implemented by taking a copy of all input lines and passing each pair through a splitter which gives us both an AND gate and an OR gate. Then the signals are just sorted, with all the AND outputs going one way and the OR outputs going the other way. Given our current inputs, these are the expected results. The next operation, selected by blue signs, is addition. Addition is done by taking a copy of each input line and feeding them into a chain of six full adders, just like what I showed in part one of this series. In this case, we're adding the number 25 to the number 13, and the result is 38. And last but not least, the operation selected by yellow signs is subtraction. Subtraction is also done using a chain of six full adders, except now we take the inverse of the six bits at the top, and the carry input of the first full adder is set to 1. Here we get the result of 25 minus 13, which is 12. If you've never seen subtraction working this way, don't worry if you can't figure out why it works. It takes a bit of math to explain. If you're interested, you can look up 2's complement. And now I will wrap up the video by showing you a demonstration of the ALU in action.
I hope you enjoyed this video. Next time, I will continue to build the CPU by adding more components, such as an instruction decoder, execution control logic, and more registers. Hopefully, we'll even be able to run our first program. As always, thank you for watching. Let me know what you think, and see you next time.